In February, the federal government invoked the Emergencies Act for the first time ever to clear the convoy protests. That triggered the requirement for a full inquiry into why. Six weeks of witness testimony is about to wrap up, making it a good time to ask, what have we learned? With us now on that, in the nation's capital, Michael Kempa, Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of Ottawa, Kara Swiebel, Director of the Fundamental Freedoms Program at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, Laura Osmond, reporter covering federal politics for the Canadian press, and here in our studio, human rights lawyer Alex Neve, a commissioner for the Ottawa People's Commission, formerly the Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada's English branch. Welcome to you all. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us in studio and online. Um, Let's talk, as I mentioned, six weeks of hearings for the Emergency Act inquiry are scheduled to end tomorrow. I'm going to start with you, Michael. Looking back, what were some of the most revealing developments? Well, going back to near the beginning, just the huge level of dysfunction at the upper levels of Ottawa police, their relationship with their civilian oversight body, the Police Services Board, and the poor relationship between that board and the municipality of Ottawa, conflict with the mayor and so forth. This was things that we had heard about for quite some time, but the degree of dysfunction was absolutely shocking. Laura, I'm going to come to you. What, looking back at the, you know, the past, even from several months ago to this inquiry here, uh, some of the most revealing stuff. You know, to me, there's no bigger revelation than the fact that the government did not stick to what we might call the letter of the legislation when deciding the definition of an emergency when they decided to declare one. And so we know that the language in the uh, the act is very similar to that in the CSIS Act. In fact, they're the exact same words. Uh, but the government says on legal advice, they know that they can use a different interpretation of those words for this legislation. And so that, I think, is really the crux of why we're here, whether the government was justified in invoking this act and whether it was legal. And I don't think we're going to get answers to that. Kara, I'm going to come to you. I, I probably agree um, that that was one of the biggest, um, you know, the biggest revelations is that the government had a, a different interpretation of what the, the law said and what it meant. And, um, you know, I, I think as well, we've we've heard, uh, you know, at the time that the, the act was invoked, there was a lot of talk about um, the, the presence of ideologically motivated violent extremists in the crowd and things like that. And and certainly we've had evidence that there are were elements of that. Uh, but I also think the evidence has, has shown that that was not um, that was not really what the bulk of people there were were there for. Um, and I think that's significant. Alex. Uh, well, I get to build on all three of those comments, which I agree with, and I guess I'd add to the mix two things. Number one, uh, it's really been uh, a revelation how inadequate the framework for intergovernmental cooperation and coordination is in this country, whether it be at political or policing level, all three levels, federal, municipal, and provincial. And then secondly, and I suppose this uh, resonates strongly for me, given what we've been hearing uh, almost throughout that exact same time period in the hearings at the Ottawa People's Commission, is the degree to which a solid human rights analysis and framework as to what was happening on the ground, especially for the people of downtown Ottawa, just didn't seem to be on anyone's mind. Uh, and uh, from where I stand, actually, that should have been one of the driving considerations, and it just didn't really seem to be on the table at all. All right, Michael, I'm going to come to you. One of the biggest questions the inquiry tackled this week is what constitutes a, a threat to national safety? When I say where do the different parties stand on this debate, I'm talking CSIS, the members of the Freedom Convoy, the federal government. We talked a little bit about, you know, the major players here. Where do these parties stand? Give us a little, give us an idea here. Well, with all due respect to Kara and Laura, I must fundamentally disagree. In fact, the government did follow the letter of both the CSIS Act and the Emergencies Act in uh, following the Section 2, the famous Section 2 standards for invoking the Emergencies Act. I will say the government has done a very poor job of explaining this, both in the Commission and in their public utterances. In fact, the exact same standards do apply to both the government and CSIS on the question of what constitutes a national emergency. But what is clear is that the precise threshold for those same standards is in fact different. When you go back to the history of the genesis of the CSIS Act and the Emergencies Act, it is clear that the threshold was always intended to be higher for CSIS because they engage in covert domestic espionage or intelligence gathering. 
the public action, the government action in declaring emergency is overt and publicly accountable through election. It's the same standards, but a different bar. The government has not explained that properly. Mr. Lametti did jumble some of the language into the second question, which is whether or not we should update the Section 2 standards. Yes, we should, but that is not a question for today, and it was certainly not a question eight months ago when we invoked the Emergencies Act. You can't make up new standards on the fly. Gary, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, I have to disagree. I mean, I think that the, uh, first of all, I mean, the government's argument is is that uh, they did use a, a different understanding. But I, I do think, actually, if you go back to to the the Hansard, if you if you look at the record when uh, the Emergencies Act was being drafted, there was a very deliberate decision to tie it to the definition in the CSIS Act, and actually not to not to replicate it in the Emergencies Act, but to tie it to whatever the CSIS, CSIS Act said at that time. So 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 if the CSIS Act definition had changed in the intervening thirty plus years, um, the Emergencies Act definition would have changed along with it. That was an intentional um, that was an intentional decision made by Parliament at the time. Um, you know, the government, I think, you, you know, they, they've got um, uh, what I would call probably a creative legal argument. Um, and certainly because it's the first time anyone's used the Emergencies Act, we don't have any jurisprudence, any case law that dictates, you know, how to interpret this this term. But in the absence of that, I would say that the, the words mean what they say. And, um, you know, I think if you if you if you watch some of uh, Minister Freeland's um, testimony today talking about uh, how important and significant the economic pressures were and what what role that really figured in into the decision making. I, I don't think that's what's contemplated by the CSIS Act definition of a threat to the security of Canada as incorporated into the Emergencies Act. I'm going to follow up on that. I'm going to go to Laura, uh, and then I'll come to a Alex here. Uh, how relevant is economic security to national security? I mean, I'm not an expert in that field, but what I can tell you is that it was a major consideration for the public, right? And so politically speaking, the government was getting a lot of pressure on the economic front. They were told, you know, this is having a huge impact on the auto sector in Windsor because the link between Windsor and Detroit, the Ambassador Bridge, was closed. And in Ottawa as well, I mean, businesses were forced to close. They didn't feel it was safe to open. They were, you know, in many places, people were advised not to go downtown Ottawa for the duration of the protest. The Rideau Centre in Ottawa, which is a massive shopping mall that employs thousands of people, was closed for weeks. Um, there was certainly economic pressure on the government. And it was having an impact on the public. And so that made it a political impetus, I think, for the government to consider that an emergency situation whether that was legally contemplated in the act, I think, is another matter. Alex. Uh, well, I, I'd agree with that. I think, uh, I think intuitively, probably a, a lot of members of the public would feel that there are some instances of extreme economic insecurity that, that may well qualify. Uh, but I think we've got the reality of the fact that that's not what the act was all about. Uh, and I am troubled, as, as Kara indicated, I am troubled by the fact that, that we do seem to have an imprecise shifting notion, uh, depending on who's on the witness stand, as to how the Emergencies Act is supposed to be interpreted. And, um, and let's not forget that while this inquiry is very much about this invocation of the Emergencies Act, we all have on our mind future possibilities of the act being invoked and for us to not have clarity not have access to that legal opinion for instance which uh, which sets the guardrails uh, around when or when not uh, it is legitimate to invoke the act uh, i think is very problematic all right speaking about the people so i want to make sure that we get some some data on here uh, i'm going to pull up a survey according to a national survey of over a thousand people across the country Two-thirds of Canadians think that it was necessary or somewhat necessary to invoke the Emergency Act to get the trucker convoy protest under control. 31% said it was unnecessary or somewhat unnecessary, and the remaining 5% said they were unsure. The survey was commissioned by CTV News, conducted by Nanos Research, and this was just earlier this week. Uh, Kara, I'm going to come to you first. I, I want to get all of your takes on this. Uh, was the Trudeau government right to invoke the Emergency Act last February? I kind of get a sense of where we stand on this. Yeah. So, so my answer is going to be no. I, I certainly understand the the um, 
you know, the, the public view that this was, um, that something had to happen, something had to be done. There's no, there's no doubt about that. The question is what, and, um, and whether there were ways um, outside of the use of this extraordinary legislation that could have done it. And, and my view is that there, there were, and, um, and, and that the act itself should not have been used here. Michael? Yes, it was justified. And what I'm saying in terms of the exact same standards from Section 2 applying to both the government and CSIS is consistent with the Hansard debates. The levels, the thresholds are different. And this came up in Mr. Vigneault's testimony, the head of CSIS. This is why he was able to say, for the purposes of CSIS's covert activities, we do not meet our threshold on Section 2 in terms of a national emergency. However, Prime Minister, the same standards apply to your job in terms of political management of an emergency crisis do apply. And that is why I, the head of CSIS, am recommending to you that the act should be invoked at this time. That is the original intent. The bars cannot be the same for CSIS and the government because that would give CSIS a veto over the government's decision to ever invoke the act, which, although I understand the logic of seeking to protect civil liberties by that very high bar for government, would in fact be a legal recipe for a police state by putting the CSIS agency in the driver's seat. Alex, I'm going to come to you. Uh, well, picking up on the polling numbers, I can certainly uh, confirm that the, the hundred or so people we've heard at the People's Commission, overwhelmingly, there was appreciation and relief uh, around the fact that the Emergencies Act was invoked, often with a degree of, of reluctance uh, that it took something like that. I myself am a little bit more ambivalent. I'm not. I'm not firmly convinced. I won't. I, I won't yet go into the camp of of clearly saying no. It was not justified. But I think we've got the wrong question. I mean, obviously, this is the question that's required to be asked mm -hmm. in this inquiry because that's what the Emergency Act Act requires. But really, the more important question is. Why is it, how is it that things were so broken and dysfunctional that three and a half weeks in, we reached a point where, justified or not, uh, it was felt that the only way to bring this to an end was the Emergencies Act. That is what we really need to understand. Laura, I'll come to you as well. And, and, and we should note that, you know, the federal government did say that this was on their list of possible resorts, not on the top. It was it was on their B list. I believe it, it was the language there. But Laura, w what's your take? You know, I think that, um, you know, it did reach a point where there was so much dysfunction at so many levels of government. And we can see through the internal communications of ministers and staff that they felt that the federal government had to be seen to be doing something because this was happening on the federal government's doorstep. So whether it was legally justified or not, um, whether it was necessary or not, I think if you think about it from a political perspective, which is, of course, a major lens that the government would have been looking through at the time, people wanted this to end and they were looking to the federal government and there was very few tools that the federal government had that would have been as effective as the Emergencies Act. And so whether it was right or wrong, I think one of the calculations that would have been on the government's mind was whether the political fallout would be greater for using the Emergencies Act and ending this, even if it was maybe not done perfectly properly or allowing it to go on indefinitely. All right, Kara, I'm gonna to come to you. The federal government of course, is making the argument that the CSIS definition of, of a national security threat is too narrow and is outdated, again, written in the 1980s. A, a different time uh, when we look at organized demonstrations, you know, we just look at sort of the crowdfunding and the sort of the, how the payments were going through, a very different time. Do you think we need a broader or at least a more updated definition of what constitutes a threat to national security? Um. So I, I think it, that's a hard question to answer because it, it depends on the purpose for which we're, we're using it. And and I you know I still have to disagree that that we're, we're talking about different standards. I don't I don't uh, I, I think it's a, a false um, argument to say that by incorporating the same definition into the Emergencies Act, we're, we're suggesting that CSIS has a veto. That's not the the argument at all. It's it's clearly the government's um, decision whether whether they feel the threshold was met. Um, not CSIS's, but um, but I think that um, and and frankly, I think you know the question of whether you get to wiretap someone or whether you get to impose exceptional, extraordinary, and likely, but for the invocation of the act, otherwise unconstitutional measures 
on a pop the entire population of Canada, that should be a very high threshold. Um, we, we need a high bar for that. So um, certainly national security, uh, the calculus has changed, the environment has changed. Um, we're a more global you know, place than we, we were in the past. And those things are important and they need to be considered. Um, but we also have to be careful that um, I think if everything is national security, then nothing is. You know, if, if everything is a, and we've seen this a bit, you know, um, the pandemic is a threat to national security. It is in a very broad sense. That doesn't mean that it justifies taking extraordinary measures and allowing the federal government to do things that they would otherwise simply not be able to do. I mean, yesterday there was, or maybe it was two days ago, there was a, a question that was put very, very plainly to one of the cabinet ministers about the federal government assuming some jurisdiction that otherwise belongs to the provinces, really taking over certain things. And, and there are aspects of what they can do under the act that does that. Those are serious constitutional ramifications. And, and, and so we need a high bar. And I don't think, um, I don't think we can just, just jam everything into that, that term of national security because it, it starts to become meaningless if we do. All right, Alex, I want to come to you. Uh, invoking the Emergency Act, even if it is deemed an extreme measure, at the end of the day served as a circuit breaker for those particularly in Ottawa. Uh, what will it mean to the people of Ottawa if the Commission finds that the use of the Act was actually unjustified? Uh, I, well, I imagine there will be some who, who may feel disappointed, but I think it depends on what else the Commissioner says. because. I think, I think really what the people of Ottawa want uh, to hear, and unfortunately the people of Ottawa themselves have had very little space to share their experience at this uh, inquiry, and I think that's one of its uh, downfalls, unfortunately. Um, but um, they're going to want to see some very clear validation of the fact that what they endured, the human rights crisis, the human rights nightmare, many would describe it as, that they went through for three and a half weeks, was not okay, uh, and um, uh, and that if it shouldn't have been the Emergencies Act, there absolutely is other things that were the responsibility of governments acting together uh, to to find a way to actually collaborate and cooperate together, to have brought it to an end uh, much more quickly. I want to talk about the other things. Laura, uh, Minister of Emergency Preparedness Bill Blair said that he believes the Emergency Act was used as a last resort, but you reported that the cabinet ministers didn't exhaust every option they had to resolve the protests. Uh, what else could they have done? So here's the thing, the federal government doesn't have a strong jurisdiction on the ground, right? This right. is really up to you. municipal and provincial governments have the most power on the ground. And so we got to see some really interesting cabinet documents that we would not normally get to see in the normal uh, course of things. And it was kind of a menu of options that the federal government looked at quite early on. One of them I found particularly interesting was a national listening exercise, uh, similar to what was done in France with the Yellow Vest protest, uh, to go across the country and, and hear from people and let them know that their message was being heard. It would have taken perhaps some of the steam out of the protest. Ultimately, they didn't go that way. They had other options on the table as well. Um, but what we heard from ministers is that they felt that those options would not have been effective. They could have wasted a lot of time trying a lot of ineffective things. And ultimately, they decided to use their, their plan B or, or track two option, however you want to put it, um, to use the Emergencies Act and invoke new powers for themselves and for the city and the, and the province. Michael, I want to come to you. I, th I feel like through this commission and, and the inquiry, we've, we've learned a little bit more about policing in Ontario. And I'm hoping, oh, can you shed some light in terms of what we've learned about uh, of policing in this province? Yeah, well, I think it fits into what my colleagues there have just said, especially that the main point of this inquiry, uh, beyond just saying, did the government do the right or the wrong thing in invoking the EA, is to identify the breakdown in the chain of civil institutions that led to this invocation to begin with. One of the most important breakdowns is at the level of policing and the civilian governance of policing. There's a concept in law, we've heard a lot about it at the Commission, in terms of the operational independence of the police. And this has been spoken about in very unhelpful terms, I think, as the separation between church and state over and over again at the Commission. This is, in fact, a legal nonsense. 50 years of reports and inquiries looking into the proper relationship between police and political overseers, civilian oversight bodies, shows that police must absolutely share operational information with their civilian oversight bodies. 
There is nothing improper about civilian oversight bodies, or in the case of the RCMP, that's ministers in public safety, sharing suggestions on operational matters, providing that they do so in writing, and that the chiefs have the final say. If we don't sort this out, we will see very similar collapses of policing that we saw around this Freedom Convoy, that we saw at Ipperwash, that we saw at the G20 summit in Toronto in 2010. It all came back to the same issue, as report after report has said, that operational independence is an overstated concept. All right, uh, Laura, I'm going to bring you in. Uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, I, I want to talk about uh, potentially what we might see tomorrow here. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is scheduled to speak tomorrow. What can we expect from his testimony? Will there be anything sort of groundbreaking? I mean, my understanding over six weeks of testimonies that we've covered a lot of ground, we've heard the same story from several different angles. It's going to be difficult for the prime minister to come to the witness stand with new information. Still, I think people are interested in what he has to say. What was going through the prime minister's mind when he decided to invoke the Emergencies Act? Because ultimately, this was his decision. Him and his cabinet made this decision. He is the leader of this cabinet. He's accountable for the decision. And because the cabinet has opted to um, uh, hold on to solicitor client privilege and not, uh, not waive that privilege and not show Canadians what advice they were getting. It's up to them to justify the decision now. And the buck stops with him. Alex, there were some notable politicians, uh, particularly in this province, that were not there. Uh, Premier Doug Ford, Deputy Premier Sylvia Jones managed to get out of testifying uh, because of immunity. Um, should they have testified, even if they didn't have to? Oh, absolutely. I think it's disgraceful and cowardly that they didn't. You know, just focusing on the province of Ontario, we've got all sorts of federal level leadership, including, as noted, tomorrow the Prime Minister. We've obviously heard from a number of municipal uh, level politicians, including councillors and the mayor at the time. There's obviously one piece of the puzzle that's missing. And, and this line that uh, Premier Ford keeps using, that this was totally federal, this is federal legislation, it was a decision made by the federal government uh, to invoke a federal law, uh, is ridiculous. Because uh, what Ontario was or was not doing uh, at all sorts of levels, political and policing, fed directly in uh, to that federal decision. And the fact that he's not prepared to join all the others who are coming forward with a sense of accountability, but I think also, very importantly, a, a willingness uh, to real, reveal some information is deeply troubling. Kara, I want to get your take on this, because I know you've talked about this a bit uh, in, in the past. Is there a missing piece here when we don't have uh, these provincial leaders uh, uh, testifying? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think I, I agree with everything that Alex has said. Um, it's, um, you know, I think that the people of the province of Ontario deserve to hear from uh, the premier about about this. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we didn't hear it in fairness. We didn't hear from some other provincial premiers either, um, although we got a, a glimpse into some text messages uh, with, from Jason Kenney um, you know, the last couple of days that were, were interesting. But, you know, the, the reality is that Ontario was where there were um, at least two and then more and more major, you know, locations of activity. Um, it's also clear that, um, frankly, I think it's been clear from the, the evidence that's been adduced so far to the commission. And, um, you know, perhaps if the premier had something to say about this, we would have heard about it. But um, that, that frankly, you know, Ottawa was not really a major concern of, of the province. They thought that was either municipal or federal, but not provincial. They became concerned because of the Ambassador Bridge and the economic impacts. And that's when they decided to take some more action and, and use their own emergency powers. Um, but I, I, I think it is a big missing piece. And um, and, and I, I think it's a, you know, a failure of leadership to, to not, um, not participate in this very important process. Uh, Kara, I want to stick with you. Uh, the lead up to the convoy protest in Ottawa. Um, do you believe that the government had preconceived notions about this convoy being violent? Um, I think that, you know, it, it's interesting. I think one of the things that the commission has also shown is that even though the government has um, 
you know, the federal government in particular obviously has access to law enforcement expertise through the RCMP, intelligence expertise through CSIS and other intelligence agencies. Um, they also spend a lot of time, like the rest of us, you know, on their phones, looking at Twitter, um, and, and they can't help but be influenced by some of that. Um, and so I do think there were um, there were some some potentially preconceived notions. I think also the you know the the prime minister in particular um, and his staff had just been through an election where they faced some um, some difficult people with some uh, you know particular extreme views. Um, and so I, I think there were some some ideas there that. Um, and again, I, I don't deny that there were elements of that in the protest, but I, I don't think it was a helpful narrative that the government really did sort of paint everyone with that same brush. I think that that, um, you know, in an already polarized situation um, made matters worse. Um, and that was, you know, one of the things that uh, Jason Kenney in, in his text said was, you know, calling them all Nazis didn't help either. And, and I think that that's true. I think that, that, you know, there were certainly we saw symbols of hate. We saw harassment of people. It's it's a serious and concerning problem. But that wasn't everyone in the crowd. Um, and that wasn't everyone who donated and who felt, you know, who felt like they they wanted to push back against what what they saw as an overly intrusive government that had gotten very used to, you know, to, to frankly poking its nose into people's business during the pandemic and doing things that we would normally um, normally not see. Alex, I'm going to come to you. Uh, as mentioned, you know, some protesters displayed hateful signs, including swastikas, Confederate flags, anti-LGBTQ plus messaging. Has the inquiry done enough to address ties to white supremacist or other hateful groups by some organizers or supporters? Uh, I mean, I guess I guess we'll see when the report comes out, uh, because there's um, not only what they're hearing uh, publicly, there's obviously other documentation right. and other inputs they've had. Um, I hope it's there. Um, uh, I think there's a concern that it that it hasn't received the attention it should. Uh, it certainly is very much uh, on the mind of, of the residents of, of downtown Ottawa and at the People's Commission. So much of the testimony we've been hearing focuses on that and how those expressions and flags and symbols and chants and encounters that involved racism and hate were, literally were terrorizing people, were one of the key factors that was uh, keeping a lot of people trapped uh, in their homes. Um, and so that really needs to be in the frame here, and I don't think it has been as much as it needs to be. I'm going to stick with you here. How about the members of the Progressive Conservative Party that supported this convoy? Should they be held accountable? I think we do need to pay attention to that. Uh, it, I, I mean, I don't think I need to go uh, to point to some of the obvious instances of, of a whole range of leaders who were showing very public and sometimes enthusiastic support uh, and sometimes almost unconditional uh, for what was happening with the convoy. Uh, and uh, and that seems to uh, have a lot of attention in political space. It's used for partisan political purposes. Uh, but I think it needs a broader analysis as well. Uh, to what degree was that contributing to uh, some of the harms, for instance, that, that people were experiencing? To what degree did that uh, contribute to uh, continuation of, of the convoy uh, longer than it should have? Um, I, I don't know that we're going to likely see much about that in, in Justice Rouleau's report. Uh, but it certainly still is there as a very troubling aspect. Laura, I'm going to come to you. In just a couple of months, we will be coming up on the one-year anniversary of the Freedom Protest. Will Freedom Truckers take to the streets again? I think that's a big question. Uh, a lot could happen between now and then, and I think it, you know, is going to have something to do with how all of this uh, commission is resolved. If you had asked me a few days ago, I would have said that this has been a really healing exercise for people. You know, people on all sides, I think, felt that the process was fair. Uh, people were being heard, uh, including uh, protesters and organizers and supporters. Um, and so it felt the tension going down, even though everyone felt that this inquiry was going to ratchet the tension up. I felt it going the other direction. In the last week or so, I have personally sensed that there's been a change there, that because certain evidence isn't being heard, um, that the convoy organizer's lawyer wants to bring to the fore, that we're getting a sense of that tension again. 
I also got the sense that during the protests uh, last year, oh my goodness, not even a year ago, um, that they were attracting a lot of people who didn't have super close ties to the protest or the organization, but did have strong feelings about COVID-19 mandates, did have strong feelings about uh, needing to be vaccinated or losing their jobs and just showing up to show that kind of dissent without public health measures in place now. Uh, that kind of support may not be there. And so the numbers may not be in their favor to try to stage another large scale protest. Michael, I'm going to get you to respond to that, but I'm also going to ask, uh, do you think there will be a different uh, sort of approach this time around if there is indeed uh, a, a gathering in Ottawa? Well, there will absolutely have to be, uh, simply for the reason, and this is why that bar for the invocation of the A must be high, certainly must be high. We cannot ever invoke the Emergencies Act again to deal with mass protest in our society. We need a better plan because protest will be on the increase in our context of polarization and the capacity of groups to organize. We must have our democratic institutions ready and a plan in place to separate peaceable protesters, green, green zones, if you will, from those who come with bad intentions. I believe we will be ready moving forward. Car, I'm going to come to you. Uh, what kinds of outcomes from this inquiry would serve Canadians best? Uh, it's so hard because I know that you know these these reports from commissions come out, and um, there's generally you know a pretty small segment of the population, often lawyers uh, and policymakers, that that actually you know read the whole thing. Uh, but I hope we'll get sort of a. Um, an executive summary that's in very sort of plain terms that lays out um, some of the some of the findings, um, some of the key sort of fact findings, um, and also um, you know obviously recommendations about, about the future and about how to to do this. And and I I think I would hope that um, you know governments would look at this and even if they don't agree with um, with sort of the way in which the the commission finds facts that they would still um, try to consider very seriously uh, recommendations for improving, you know, the, the way we do things. Because I think, you know, I, I think there's, um, we can point blame, there's there's a lot of blame that could go around, I think, in this um, situation of, of uh, lots of mistakes that were made um, and lots of lessons learned. So I hope that will be, a, a, and I think it will be a big focus of, of the report. Um, yeah, that's my hope. Alex, same question to you. Uh, well, I, I, you know, wherever the Commission lands on the question of whether or not it was justified to invoke the Act, uh, my hope is that we get a clear set of recommendations uh, as to what should have happened instead. And uh, that's what will put us in, in better stead going forward. Uh, certainly, even to your question of, of um, uh, whether we're going to look at a repeat of this in, right. in February or some other time, uh, we need to have clear recommendations as to what needs to change. Uh, across uh, the federal government, but certainly in the ways that the federal government uh, coordinates and cooperates with provincial and municipal governments as well. Uh, and then the other piece is I'm, I really hope that we'll hear some strong human rights analysis in there as well, because I think we often overlook at the end of the day so much about everything that happened here was about human rights. The right to protest uh, is a key human right. Uh, but the devastating impact on communities was all about human rights as well. And I'd like to see a really solid human rights framework proposed um, uh, as something that governments should be taking forward. Michael, I'll get you on that same cue if possible uh, in terms of you know, what kind of outcomes for Canadians. Well, I agree with everything that's been said. And I'll, I'll just add on top of that really enhance democratic control of all of our authority institutions in society. So put police under the control of civilian oversight bodies. Make sure there are clear protocols for when provinces must step in to help municipalities. Improve the definition of how CSIS answers to government and specify that bar of when exactly those same standards or updated standards do kick in. A vague, objective, subjective kind of test is just not adequate for the situation at hand. Make it clear and make it more difficult to do this ever again. Laura, we have one minute and you get the last word. And I'm hoping as well to sort of ask you as well, what can we expect when tomorrow wraps up? What, what, what are sort of the next steps as well? 
Sure. So I'll start with that. I'll tell you that now that the witnesses are going to be all wrapped up, we're going to hear some closing arguments, I believe, on Friday. And then after that, they get into some policy work, looking at things like the role of misinformation and that kind of thing. And the lawyers are going to be discussing some reports that have been conditioned by experts and digging into those kind of issues-based things a little bit more. And then we'll get the uh, final report next year. Um, in terms of what would serve Canadians, I think, you know, I spoke to Perrin Beatty before this inquiry started. He was the minister at the time who actually drafted the Emergencies Act. And I asked him about some of these accountability measures like the inquiry. And he said he just didn't want Canadians to be left with the government saying, if you knew what we knew, you would agree, just trust us. Mm -hmm. He wanted there to be transparency without seeing uh, the legal evidence that the government received in terms of the threshold for declaring an emergency. We are left in that situation. And so I think that Justice Rouleau's findings are going to be really important in order to maintain the spirit of the act, which is as much transparency around this decision as humanly possible. We will have to wait and see. Michael, Laura, Kara, Alex, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the program. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.